So I spent the last couple of weeks watching TED Talks trying to figure out how to do an introduction for this, and as of yesterday, I had absolutely nothing. Um, and so, fortunately, somebody asked this question yesterday, what's our next untapped resource? Uh, and I realized that that's actually what I'm here to answer. So I solved the equation, everyone can go home after this. Um, our next untapped resource is the E1 to E5 community. Uh, and there's two reasons for that. First of all, the junior enlisted community is the closest to the smallest points of friction. Those are the ones that we don't realize, but they add up, and over time they create the service level problems that everybody here is generally facing, right? And the second one is that the junior enlisted community is also a lot more capable than we usually give them credit for. Uh, and this is an example of that. So that's a list of guys that I've worked with uh, since I joined the Marine Corps three years ago. And you can see we've got an accountant, investment banker, a legal assistant, we've got an aerospace engineer from Georgia Tech, uh, the teacher down there actually was teaching English in Egypt during the Arab Spring. Uh, we had a firefighter and then a whole bunch of retired drug dealers. Um, <laughs> and, and the crazy thing about them, thankfully for the drug dealers especially, is that none of them were doing that in the Marine Corps. Um, actually, every single person on that list was either a machine gunner or a, an anti-tank missileman. Uh, they were all enlisted, they were all E5 or below, mostly E4 and below. Um, and so what I realized coming in is, is I thought I was going to be the only guy coming from my background, which I'll talk about in a minute, and instead it's like this grab bag of talent that's sitting just below the surface in, in the junior enlisted community. And so with all this talent in the junior enlisted community, it seems like, wow, that should be a real engine of, of creativity and innovation, right? But instead it's not. It's like a bleak wasteland of innovation, right? So we're not, we're not finding it anywhere. And so the question that we were asking ourselves, you know, my buddies and I, uh, was, you know, why are we so dumb, basically, right? Well, why does the journalist community get treated like we're dumb, and then why do we return the favor by being dumb? So we looked around, we found the enemy, and it was ourselves, right? Usually, we, we kind of credit the frozen middle or this crushing bureaucracy or something like that, but really what we found the problem was is actually it was other squad leaders. Uh, and the reason it was other squad leaders is that we created this self-reinforcing culture where you came in, you shed all of your prior experiences, all of your knowledge, everything, and you just became the new guy. In the Marine Corps, it's the boot, I think in the Navy, it's non-ray, in the Army, it's cherry. I don't know what it is in the Air Force. But it's like one term, and it sums you up, right? And in the Marine Corps, boots uh, are stupid, they are inexperienced, they're young, they're childish, they make terrible decisions, they aren't critical thinkers at all, right? And so we get them, and we have a little boot protocol to raise our boots. That's what we say, at least in the infantry, we're going to raise our boots, right? So we get boots, and then we break everything down Barney-style for them, and we hold their hand. And these are all phrases that we use on a regular basis, right? And so we get these guys, and we need to know, first of all, that they respect us and that we're in charge. So we have part of boot protocol is like all of the outward signals that I own you. Uh, so the first one is haircuts, right? All the new boots in the Marine Corps, they have to get super high fits. It's a terrible haircut. Uh, it's like us and Vietnam veterans are getting that. And then... <laughs> uh, the second one is it, you have to stand at parade rest. So anytime you're talking to anybody when you're a new guy, you're standing like this. And it's not like lazy parade rest, it's like snap to parade rest, like you're on a recruiting poster, right? The third one is... Anybody who walks by, you have to give them the proper greeting of the day. And when you're at a battalion in the infantry community, there's a million people walking by all the time. So you spend your entire day trying to look at their collar and figure out what rank they are so you can give them the proper greeting of the day. That's where all of your intellectual capability is going, is saying good morning, good afternoon, good evening. And it honestly gets so stressful that guys will get the wrong time of day. It'll be 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and they'll go, good morning, Sergeant. And you're like, it's 2 o'clock in the afternoon, man. Like, what are you thinking? But he's so worried about saying the proper greeting of the day that he just spouts out whatever pops into his head, right? Um, and so these are all like really insignificant things. Those are those tiny points of friction that I'm talking about. Uh, and only the junior enlisted community is really seeing these things. Uh, and a lot of times the officer community, actually, I had, you know, I had a, a company commander one time that told me, all these things are good for you because you know, it, it raises the guys the right way, right? So we actually had sort of a self-reinforcing culture at, at the command level as well. And so, when you follow boot protocol, uh, it, what it's supposed to spit out is that guy, John Bassalone. Uh, you're just supposed to get just a machine of obedience and discipline and just charge it directly into the gunfight, uh, guns blazing, right? And instead, you get that guy. 
<laughs> and then we looked around and we go, why didn't we get John Bassler? Right? So I can, well, I can laugh at this because that's me, right? That was me two years ago. Um, and and it, despite the goofy grin there, uh, this is probably one of the lowest points in my life. Uh, and the reason it was is because I felt like I had been deprived of all of my agency, all of my critical thinking ability, uh, all of my intellectual capability. I was having trouble putting together sentences for 20-year-olds as a 23-year-old, right? And, and that was a huge problem for me. Uh, and the reason it was a huge problem is that a year before I had graduated from Georgetown University with a degree in political science. Say again? Oh, okay, sorry about that, sorry. Um, so, so a year before, I, I, I just graduated from Georgetown, where I had defended my thesis in front of a board, and then a year later, a 20-year-old passing me was throwing me off kilter because I, I couldn't remember if it was the morning or the afternoon. And that was a huge problem. And if you think it's, it, this is an isolated incident, you're wrong because every single person has this problem. Uh, and, and again, I, I know this is very specific to the Marine Corps infantry. My suspicion is that it's pretty widespread. So I'm going to kind of extrapolate it and say every, it's pretty widespread. I'm getting a thumbs up here. So I'm thinking it's the case, right? Mm -hmm. So th this is an example, right, of, of how widespread it is. I'm going to run down the line real quick. This is my first fire team. Uh, and I'm going to start up front here. This is Alex Dillon. Alex moved out of his house when he was 16. He had a mom who was addicted to heroin. So he moved out of his house and he couch surfed for several years. He was picking up any job he could, so he learned how to hang drywall. Uh, he learned how to work retail, and then he settled in that good drug dealing community there for a while, right? Uh, and, and then he, he joined the Marine Corps, right? Because he needed to get his life back in order. He wanted some, some direction uh, and some focus. The guy right next to him, uh, Edge. Edge grew up working on lumbering equipment with his dad. And so he is a phenomenal diesel, diesel mechanic at like 20 years old. Uh, if you put a mechanical problem in front of that guy, he will solve it in two hours with laser focus that you would be hard to find in any other community, right? And then the, the third guy after him, uh, the guy hanging up the, the hang loose sign there, that's Greg. So Greg has, has two kind of interesting backgrounds. One is he went to ECU and studied recreational therapy uh, and was the uh, captain of the club lacrosse team. So he's like the ultimate bro. Uh, and then <laughs> two, uh, he has a brother who's a Navy SEAL and a brother who is an Army um, engineer. And Greg was such a student of the game in the infantry that he would go home on the weekends, and he and his brothers would rearrange all the furniture in their house and just clear rooms over and over and over again all day, right? And then he would come back, and he would try and teach us that, and a squad leader who had been in and had been in, you know, X uh, firefight in X city, right, would come in and say, no, actually, the solution is we just shove everybody through the door, and the first guy gets shot, and then that's the ball, right? Uh, so we had all this creativity, but then nobody was leveraging it. Um, and the cool thing that happened was, normally you're going to have a senior leader that's going to be in charge of the fire team. So it's going to be one senior and then three boots. Uh, but we ran out of seniors, and so I got kind of dubbed the, the vehicle commander for this. We were mounted with ten, so I, I was dubbed the vehicle commander for this. And so uh, I couldn't rule with the iron fist that everybody else did because we were all boots together. So we had to start leveraging this, this team network, and we had the benefit of having uh, Greg and his brother come in and talk about leadership strategy all the time, which obviously everybody here knows the, the soft community works a lot differently than general purpose forces. So we kind of pulled in this soft mentality, Greg called it thinking shooters, um, and, and we ended up with uh, this sort of innovation engine, right? And then we extrapolated it further, and we took it outside of the infantry community, and, and we started pulling in people from, and so if I, if I start from the left here, that's an armorer, an admin clerk, uh, and then we've got two radio battalion guys, which frankly nobody knows what radio battalion does in the right? Uh, so, so we went down and we found them. And the way that I found these guys is I walked around uh, Camp Lejeune asking people in the PX if they knew anything about drones. And it turns out they did, right? So we built this team of all these different MOS uh, groups, but everybody had a different background that we weren't leveraging. Uh, we pulled them up and we started this project where we were going to 3D print squad level UAS we we're going to cut the cost by about 30 times uh, of what we were going to be paying for it, uh, and as well as field it a year earlier. Um, thankfully, Chris Wood, uh, Howie Morado really spearheaded this innovation uh, challenge at the installation logistics level, and we were able to do that. So nobody here is, is a squad leader. Well, do we have any squad leaders here? So no, so we have no, no squad leaders here. So the question is, what do you all do to, to find this talent and pull it up? So I tried to come up with three opportunities here. The first one. Uh, for all the, the software programmers, I know application-based gets everybody excited, but 
What I mean by application-based non-traditional career opportunities is not software applications. What I mean is you need to offer people the opportunity to apply into a community. Because the Marines, the sailors, soldiers, et cetera, who have these talents, uh, most of the time the command doesn't recognize it. So they're not going to nominate them, and you're not going to find them. So you need to open it up and allow them to apply, because they'll put their resume on the table and you'll, you'll say, wow, that corporal is the guy that we've actually been looking for. The second one is innovation challenges. Innovation challenges, we found this to be extremely effective. Uh, they're doing it again now with the Marine Corps Warfighting Laboratory, and that gives you another opportunity uh, to really get, at, get out there and, and reach the enlisted community. They'll build a team and they will try and, and, and solve the problem. And then the third one is a junior enlisted uh, liaison officer. And this is kind of the most far-fetched one, but the reason I think it's important is that if we can build a Rolodex of these, uh, these guys out there, these men and women out there, rather, um, if we can build that Rolodex, we can go plug into those communities when we need to solve a problem. And a lot of times they have a hard time vocalizing exactly what they mean, so this LNO can be kind of the translator, right? Because it's a different culture uh, down in the operating forces than it is up top. So anyway, what I want to close on, my buddies all think it's hysterical that I come do stuff like this uh, and that I'm not working with the grunts anymore. Uh, but one of my buddies said this right before I came up here. He goes, why are you going up there? Every problem in the Marine Corps has already been solved in the barracks. Um, <laughs> but I think, it, I think it's actually, it's not too far from, from the case if you go and find it. So that, with that, thank you very much for, for having me. Questions, sir. Could you talk a little bit more about the uh, the enlisted liaison op, like, and how you think that might work on a practical level? Like, I, I, I'm really interested in that. I'd love to see how we might put it in practice. Yeah. So, uh, beginning in January, I'm going to be going up to the Marine Corps Warfighting Laboratory, and I have kind of a really abstract title of just Commander Special Advisor. Uh, and so one of my goals is to, to kind of pilot this program. And what I'd like to do is, the Marine Corps Warfighting Laboratory is doing this program called Sea Dragon 2025 right now, where they're doing a bunch of experimentation war gaming. Uh, and they are looking for enlisted involvement, but they don't know where to find it. So what I want to do is just go up there and, and go on like basically a traveling tour, and just go meet with people from every community, build that Rolodex, and then when somebody says, hey, we're going to look into to drones or whatever, then I can kind of go through my little black book and say, here are five people I want to call and get on the phone. Uh, and I think that's that's probably you know my pilot idea is that it would be somebody who can do something like that. Um, and, and the key again is that you have to be able to translate what they are saying tactically to what can be read and understood inside the beltway. Because most of the time, what you're going to get from them is kind of you know complaints and, and a jumble of words. Uh, but it's, there's great content in there. It's just the way that they talk. Uh, so if you can translate that, and that's why that's a, that's a special guy that, and I think it's got to be most of the time, uh, it's either got to be a really forward-thinking, approachable junior officer, or it's got to be an E5 or below. E6 and up, at least in the Marine Corps, is going to cut that one. I mean, I'd be more than happy to talk to you about that as well. So uh, one, one of the issues that I've, I've run into is that the, uh, the skill sets that people have inherently, you know, uh, the, the mechanical engineer that comes in because he wants to serve his country. Now, if we actually don't use those skill sets, uh, they're no longer promotable. So how, how, do we, how do we solve this issue? How do we provide pop cover for the people who are performing above and beyond what their current rank is and provide them either uh, normal promotion or actually advanced um, I can only speak to the Marine Corps on this one, but in the Marine Corps we have the MOS Career Roadmap, uh, and that tells you uh, from day one all the way through exactly where you're supposed to be. So year six, I'm supposed to be a drill instructor, and now I'm a drill instructor, and that's right. And I saw a master sergeant the other day who was complaining to me that he followed the Career Roadmap to a T and still didn't pick up master guns, right? So even the Career Roadmap doesn't work. So what I would say is throughout the Career Roadmap, it's not effective for us, right? You'll have guys that stay in the community. Uh, but again, if you, if you move to something like these application-based systems uh, and then start leveraging that talent when they come back in the operating forces, they eventually want to get back. I've been out of, of the grunts for about a year now. I'm itching to, to get back with the guys, right? So they'll, they'll come back to you. Uh, but sometimes, actually, they might just leave, right? But they'll be doing good things in the, in the next community, right? The drone project is a great example. So some of those Marines, they're not going to stay, right? But they've said, like, the magic word, which is, I still want to stay plugged in when I get out which is awesome because most of the time, Marines are like, yes, boom, gone. Out the door, 
peel my sticker off the back of my car. I was never a Marine. I'm going to grow a beard down in the middle of my chest. Right? Um, so, so I think, you know, one, you have to accept your, you know, these guys have outside talents uh, that are going to take them other places. So trying to hold them into the organization isn't always the case. You know, it's not always going to work. But, but giving them the opportunity to do these application-based non-traditional options and then allowing them to move back into their old communities kind of seamlessly, I think that's the key. Hello. It seems like uh, it seems like this problem maybe starts with the way we do recruiting. Have you started to look at ways to attack that system a little bit and kind of change it as it's happening? So bringing in great people with phenomenal backgrounds that we don't leverage at all. Um, and part of it's because of, I would think it's because of the metrics that recruiters are measuring to. Um, have, you, have you looked at that at all? I, I think it's great that we look at existing people, but we have this engine that's continuing to turn to bring new people in kind of filtering into this pipeline. Right. It seems like we kind of cut the head off the snake. Um, so we've talked a little bit about this. Um, and I, I actually don't think the problem is necessarily the recruiting. And here's why. Is that all those guys that I listed at the beginning, right, they all wanted to be infantry. So it's not that they came to the recruiter's office and said, I'd like to use this skill set from Marine Corps. And we said, absolutely not. You will do this, right? They all came in because they actually wanted to do something different. The thing is, we just have that talent now at our disposal. So, I would, I would say recruiting is less the problem. You're getting, the Marine Corps is getting a lot of talent. More talent, I think, than they probably had ever. Like General Dan was saying yesterday, you know, it's, you're not really getting the 70 IQ guy anymore. You're getting really intelligent people that want to do the jobs that they get assigned to, a lot of the times, right? Um, the problem is once we get them in. So if you're a recon guy and you fail out, they punish you by sending you to the admin side, right? Well, that guy becomes totally ineffective for four years, right? Uh, and then the other problem that we have is school of infantry. So boot camp, I, I wouldn't change boot camp. And none of the enlisted guys I worked with would change boot camp, right? It's a great transformational process. When you get to school of infantry, they immediately kill all ingenuity. They make dumb marines from the beginning. And, and by the time they hit the fleet, regardless of their MOS, they're defeated. And every single marine says that. Talk to a marine, ask him the worst time of his life, he'll say school of infantry. Uh, and everybody goes through. So if you want to fix the Marine Corps enlisted side, fix school of infantry. You can fix school of infantry, you're going to get smarter brains coming out. They want to be doing the jobs that they got assigned to, but they also want to pull these additional skill sets. I, but, but, you know, not to, not to preclude that there are problems with, with uh, recruitment. I just think we actually are recruiting a, a bit wide. Catalog, people skills are as they're coming in, just I absolutely think that's the case here. Because a lot of them, you know, when they get out, it's the same problem, right? They get out and they're like, like, what's your skill set? And they're like, well, I'm really good at shooting people in the face. And it's like, well, you, I wouldn't put that on the resume for the BS. Thanks, John. <laughs>